Hi, I'm Max Temkin, one of the co-creators of Cards Against Humanity, and this is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. Last year, over 500 people submitted their unpublished games to a panel of expert judges. 16 finalists came to Gen Con to pitch their games in person, and one of those games will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be named the champion of Tabletop Deathmatch. My name is Edward Castronova, and I'm a professor at Indiana University, and uh, I've made a game about Jane Austen novels and the ladies who are in those novels and how they're, they're trying to get married in a very difficult situation. I don't think too many people think of characters in Jane Austen or young women as if they were strategic sort of gamer type people, but in fact they had a difficult information problem, and, uh, and I thought it would be really, really fun to act out being that kind of a person. Even though I'm not a young lady in Jane Austen's day, I thought it would be fun to have this problem of maneuvering these men around and getting them to see the light and understand that they're supposed to be marrying me. I've been making games since I was a little kid. I haven't ever published a game, but it's just always been fun, like if I read a book, to think about well, what kind of a game does this involve and be in that situation and making that choice for myself instead of watching how other people do it. Yeah, I mean, I started playing games when I was eight, and I always made little mods on the side, and I just continued it as a hobby until today. My game lets players act like they are in Regency England, and they're all young ladies who are trying to get men to marry them. Some people who are into that are what you might call role players. They've read the Jane Austen novels, they love Jane Austen, a lot of times they're sort of middle-aged women. But there's another group of players who are kind of more campy about it. You know, and it's really fun to see this mix. You know, you'll see the role-playing lady say, I'm afraid that my mother opposes that match. And then the gamer guy says, oh yeah, well your mother can go <laughs> in my line of work, we're used to getting rejections. You know, we're always writing books and papers and things like this, and then you get these nasty rejection letters, very angry. And so to actually have something given a stamp of approval, like, yes, we kind of like this, it felt better. I haven't felt this good about an acceptance in 20 years. And I wrote to all my professors, I was like, this is a lot better than getting a refereed paper acceptance. <laughs> Can you believe it? There were 500 entries that I made in the last 16. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. All right, uh, Ted, thanks so much for bringing the Jane Austen game for us to take a look at. Uh, do you want to tell us about it uh, really briefly? Sure. Uh, this is a game that I came up with. I was at a really boring academic conference, and I was reading Pride and Prejudice. And it occurred to me that the ladies in Pride and Prejudice face a pretty interesting strategic problem. They're in this kind of sexist, patriarchal world, right? And their whole objective that's forced on them is they got to get married, right? If you don't get married, you're just a loser. But the, the thing is, you don't have control over the men, right? They're kind of just wandering around randomly in Jane Austen novels. And, you know, you're trying to get them to wise up and come to you when they're supposed to. And at the same time, you don't really know enough about them. So the way the game works, basically, is the players are all ladies, which is a lot of fun if you've got a bunch of ladies who like Jane Austen, and drink Chablis, and sit around. But it's also fun with really hairy guy gamers say, okay, you know, you're playing a lady. <laughs> So I'm just going to pick, you know, Harriet Smith, uh, Jane Bennett, Jane Fairfax, and Eleanor Dashwood. Those are our four players. And then uh, some mysterious men come to town. Here's Frederick Wentworth and Edward Ferrars. If you know the novels, you know who these people are. And here's, of course, Darcy, the famous Darcy, who's so hot. Um, notice I picked out one fewer guy than the number of women. So the basic tension is like a musical chairs sort of game. One of these ladies is going to be a complete loser from the Regency standpoint, but only one of them is going to marry the best guy. How do you tell whether or not somebody is the best guy? Um, there are these feature cards, okay? So like the best one is royal lineage. This person turns out to be uh, part of the Windsor family. But also here's like shabby clothing. And so you put these out, there's one face up, and then you put a bunch of them upside down, like Elegant Dancer. And this then becomes a reverse area control game. Okay, so let's say the basic card in here is the love card. With the love card, if you play that, you pick up one heart. These would be heart-shaped in the final version. You pick up one from each guy, and then you put them on whatever lady you want. So you're saying, oh, Wentworth, he looks really good right now. So I'm going to take the blue one, that's his love, and put it on me. And Who's this shabby clothing, Mr. Ferrars? Well, I'm gonna put him on Eleanor, and I'm trying to get the best guy to come to me. 
and I'm trying to push the bad guy off on the others. And I've kind of calibrated it so you don't have perfect information by the end. The resolution of the game is basically whichever lady has the most of the guy's cubes, he proposes to her. You start with the worst guy, and you know, and if you get the proposal from the worst guy, you're like, hmm, do I take this for respectability, or do I say no in the hopes of really getting the good guy later? Okay, and so you work from the worst guy to the best guy, and then it's resolved in terms of who's married, and then the big reveal, you flip these over and find out how many points the ladies have. That's the game in a nutshell. Ever since I was a little kid, I, I dreamed of being able to travel in time, and just being able to you know, blink my eyes and all of a sudden I'm on the Titanic, or uh, you know, I'm talking to Voltaire. And so by playing the Jane Austen game, you have this ability to just sort of jump back into Regency England. And uh, that's always felt really good to me. Um, so Pride and Prejudice is my favorite novel. I've read it 30 times. Um, my concern, or I'd like to, to hear what you have to say about this, is that the reason Austenites are obsessed with Lizzie Bennet and, and characters like that is in fact that they break out of this particular dynamic that you're, you're creating. That, that, that this concept is in fact universally mocked by the creator of the novel. And so this seems to embrace the concepts that Jane Austen fans, Austenites, really sort of laugh at and, and, and push aside. And that's the, that's the disconnect I'm having with this game. Actually, I would argue for gameplay as the, the solution to the problem. In a novel, you can't really do anything. In a game, you are trying to impose your will on this system. I think that the system is something that they're opposing, and that is, if anything, the sort of, you know, postmodern statement, if you will, about making this as a game. I have a question. Um, what are the benefits of saying no? Some play, for some players, there's almost no advantage at all at saying no. Some players really want to make sure that they don't become the spinster, okay? Some players are not interested in getting, you know, respectability. They want to make sure they get the guy that they want. If you say no, then you get a chance at the second best and the, the top most. And I've seen players break down. Some will just say if they get a proposal, they, they say fine. Others will say, I'm not accepting any proposals except exactly the guy who I think is best. If someone's not a Jane Austen fan, what's the hook of the game for them? When I've play tested this with people who don't know anything about Jane Austen, it becomes this hilarious campy experience where they grab the love cubes and they say, all right, Bill, you're gonna get some of Wentworth's love and you're gonna get some of Darcy's love and you're not gonna get any of his love. You know, I'm keeping his love for me. And you get kind of a Dame Edna dynamic that starts to happen and it's, you know, well, you know, Get your fucking hands off my, my guy. <laughs> so during playtesting, uh, how much bluffing was going on? Because it seems to me like one of the big uh, aspects of this game is the hidden information. But if I, if I look at a piece of hidden information and I find out that this guy's worth a lot of points and I start taking his cubes, that's obviously a very clear indicator that, that he's good, right? Did you find that people were trying to manipulate other people's perceptions by sort of falsely giving them cubes and things like that? You know, the target demographic isn't really that kind of a deep stra strategic player, but those who have played the game start doing that. They're, you start to see poker playing and, and a little bit of analysis paralysis. But, you know, I, I, to be entirely honest, most of the people who get into this game um, don't sort of rise to that to that level. Are there, like, are, are all the matches, like, objectively good or objectively bad? Is there any, is there any subjectivity? Like, is there... Is Wentworth a good match for Jane Fairfax? Like, is there any, anything along that line in the game? In the mechanics, there's no difference other than these, okay. uh, the, those, those cards. Um, when you're playing with Jane Austen experts, they will start to role play, you know, what if Emma ended up matched with a guy like Collins and no. So it's a slash fiction that. game. Yeah, it becomes slash fiction with those kind of players. I can't make the connection that Fitzwilliam Darcy is randomly assigned a, a set of abilities like shabby clothing and parson because that's not who that character is. Why are these characters not starting with assignments of who they already are to people who know these characters? Actually, as an optional rule, which isn't in the rule set, but it would be easy to implement, I've, I've come up with, you could do a build a guy version where you take the characters and you assign the features that you want. Now that takes the hiddenness out of it, 
So maybe you could do something like, okay, we're gonna have Darcy be just like he is in the novel and maybe have one thing that might be different. Or we could just say, Darcy is who he is. We all know who's the best guy and who's the worst. Let's go at it. So that it's, a, it's an optional form of gameplay. And I think a lot of Jane Austen fans would insist on doing it that way. Thank you so much for uh, showing us the game and um, I can't wait to play it. It looks, uh, looks really fun and uh, I, I love the theme. I think it's like a, a truly original um, inspiration for a board game. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one criticism you could raise about my game is that I I'm sort of making fun of a situation that was not nice at all, right? Women in Regency England were like, like chattel, and Austin characters are always trying to break out or break through that system to become free. And uh, you could say that a game about that situation, especially since it's lighthearted, is sort of saying, oh, well, that's okay. Isn't it funny how these women are, are having to manipulate men instead of being honest about their affections and things like that? But my response is that, well, I made it as a game precisely so that players could make their own statements about the system. Because they have the freedom to do that, I think it, it feels better because they can sort of stand up for themselves in a way that women of that time maybe couldn't. All right, uh, so judges, you guys want to come up and take a look at this and uh, what, what did everyone think? I, I, I really admire the, just the inspiration for the game and the idea of it. Like, I think it's such a, such a great angle on a, on a game and it's not like anything else I've ever seen before. I'm not quite sure if this is supposed to be comedically themed or not. I actually totally buy his read on it, which mm -hmm. is that it, it gives you the elements and then based on who the players are and what their familiarity is, with with the sort of like Jane Austen canon, they can they can make it into slash fiction. They can remix it how they like, or they can play it like really canonically. And I, I think that's cool. I think would really enjoy getting to play these stories out, you know, I their have, own way. I have a, a pretty big problem uh, in in 2013 of having a game where the women's only goal is to find a man that she marries, and I think that. Mike hit on it a little bit in, in the session where I think in the, the theme of the books, um, that's, sort of, that's sort of what they're about. They're about bucking against those trends, right? Mm -hmm. I would like to see that more yeah. highlighted in the game because even the way he describes it, he, he wrote down that uh, the player is not controlling an area. Instead, she is trying to get an area a gentleman to control her. I, I disagree. I, I think you're the author. You're Jane Austen. You create the commentary, right? You create how you read it. And so you can look at it like she does, and you know, and make fun of it. Tomorrow. Like that's what it, that's what it's missing. But it, it's not missing that. It's it's no, beautiful. It's, it's, it's an immersion property. So I, I that think the comes is, from the player. The game is very to me. To me, the game is very much like an open book. You know, if you play it like a like a strategy game and you stick to the rules sure. and you you sure. kind of min max your play, you, you're going to read it in in this way that you guys aren't happy with. And I think another way to look at it is more of an art game where you know there's there's sort of a performance happening, and and then you are free to make fun of it. You are free to change how you play, and I think that's. I think a lot of the games that do that very well make it clear that that is kind of the intent. Um, whereas something like this, uh, all the rules and all the victory conditions and all that are very yeah. very uh, straight laced and and you know as it is. Some of that could certainly be worked in with the art, some of it could certainly be worked in with the presentation, yeah. but I definitely think that's something that should be noted in that perhaps this is something that should be emphasized when the, the game is being finalized and pulled together. Where's the thing in here that makes me subversive, that makes me go around and, and create the effect that you, you just described, which is I'll be able to make whatever, I'll be the storyteller, right? If the game is actually telling me that if I want to play where Darcy is, is who Darcy is, I have to remove some of the good gameplay elements. From the person who sells these type of games, my problem is this reminds me very much of a really, really good game called Ladies and Gentlemen. Yeah. Oh. And that game is still very hard to sell to some people, and it's like tongue and cheekness yeah. is right on the box. This is this is a brilliant concept for a game. I I'm not there when I I'm not yet there to say. This is a brilliant execution of a brilliant concept for a game, but it's not terribly far from it. From a female standpoint, um, I'm not married. I don't really have a strong feeling about marriage. I think if, if you can get married and stay married, it's a good thing. So I'm, that part of it doesn't really bother me, and I've read the Jane Austen books. and it, it, what I, I'm just looking at the manufacturing standpoint, pretty easy to make. I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the art. There's no art. So when I look at it, it's wide open for me. Mm -hmm. You need an artist who can um, 
make to make it clear that you're more of the storyteller here and make it more humorous and uh, obviously that's a big part of like selling the fantasy of being in a Jane Austen novel is just having really great illustration and really you know period specific art and yeah, the, the right art style would go a really long way to clarifying and and creating some of that subversion that you've talked about um, there's a game called last will that, that does that very well uh, and and the right sort of art style that is that that period piece art but also sort of a parody of period piece yeah. I think would go a long way to to letting you play it either way cool all right I think we got a awesome well, I'm convinced that the Jane Austen game appeals to a, a, a group of people who just, they love Jane Austen and they would love to sit around with a game like this. So I will simply make a Kickstarter and, you know, show them the art, show them the rules and kind of try and advertise it among the group of people who call themselves Janeites, you know, they're kind of Jane Austen fanatics. And I'll put it out there, I'm pretty confident that a Kickstarter directed at that population will take off.